This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 294 of the program. Today is Friday, June 11th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of the folks who make this show possible. All of our newest Patreon, PayPal, YouTube, and Twitch subs, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us. And on Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube, that includes Alexander Julian, Ida Webbs, Jameson, Natalie Frieda Simon, Sarah Kim, Sebastian Simon, and Sleeper Son of Spyro. And over on Twitch, we have Balthazar228, Crazy Hawaiian and PA, Creepy Chris66, Hype Man Sam Gaming, Jason Dante, Radical Trav, Sandra T. He, Stubble Boy, and X Abel X96. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you would also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So this week, we've got another great show for you. We'll talk about the Mitch McConnell of 2021. I'm, of course, referring to Joe Manchin, who is choosing to torpedo even the most moderate things that other Democrats, even corporate Democrats, support. And we'll also look at his disingenuous response to critics. Anthony Blinken face plants when asked about Palestinian rights, and Biden's Justice Department is running interference for Donald Trump. Milo Yiannopoulos received a sign from God that being ex-gay is good, apparently. And on the subject of homosexuality, this week conservatives were outraged over Blue's Clues and Nickelodeon, and we'll also discuss the corporations that are LARPing as LGBTQ plus allies during Pride. Caitlyn Jenner embarrasses herself on national TV once again, and a new ProPublic analysis details the extent to which American oligarchs are able to get away with not paying their fair share of taxes. That's what we've got on the agenda for today's episode. Episode. Let's waste no time and get right into it. I hope you enjoy what I have in store for you. Almost knocked off my iPad, but let's do this, folks. Well, it seems as if the For the People Act is dead. And the reason why I say that is because Joe Manchin, senator from West Virginia, has decided that unilaterally he's killing it by choosing not to support it. Now, if you're unaware as to why the For the People Act is so important, well, across the country, Republicans in state legislatures have been introducing these draconian new crackdowns on voting rights. They want to explicitly suppress the rights of citizens, make voting more difficult so that way they can effectively rig future elections in their favor. Joe Manchin is saying, I am opposed to this. Now, if you're unaware how prevalent voter suppression laws are, this tweet from Bernie Sanders puts it into perspective. These are all of the states where Republicans have introduced legislation to crack down on voting rights. 48 states. And the one piece of legislation that hasn't really been that controversial, surprisingly, within the Democratic Party is the For the People Act. It expands access to voting. It makes automatic voter registration a thing in all 50 states. It ends partisan gerrymandering. It's objectively a good thing if you care about democracy. Now, there are some criticisms with the bill as it relates to third parties and not treating them as fair as uh, the Democratic Party and Republican Party. But putting that aside overall, the net positive of this bill is undeniable. And Joe Manchin unilaterally is choosing to kill it. And the reasoning he gives as to why he's not supporting it is just absolutely insane even kirsten cinema supports the for the people act that goes to show you how unreasonable joe manchin is being by not supporting it now as jake johnson of common dreams explains democratic senator joe manchin of west virginia penned an op-ed sunday vowing to oppose the for the people act when it hits the senate floor later this month and reiterating his objections to eliminating the filibuster effectively guaranteeing that the ambitious voting rights bill will fail to pass published in west virginia's charleston gazette mail manchin's op-ed comes as republicans are pushing hundreds of voter suppression measures at the state level across the nation, attacks on the franchise that could be neutralized by passage of the For the People Act. According to the latest tally by the Brennan Center for Justice, at least 14 states this year have enacted 22 new laws that restrict access to the vote. Given the enormous implications of the ongoing voting rights battle, Manchin's article drew a furious response from fellow members of Congress and progressive activists. Manchin's op-ed might as well be titled, While I'll Vote to Preserve Jim Crow, 
Crow tweeted Representative Mondaire Jones. We didn't need an op-ed to know you're unwilling to protect our democracy, Representative Mark Pocan added. The only Democratic senator who has refused to co-sponsor the For the People Act, Manchin, wrote Sunday that he will vote against the bill this month because it has advanced through Congress without Republican support. Yeah, so he's not supporting it because Republicans aren't supporting it, and it's partisan, and bipartisanship is everything, according to him. So since no Republicans are supporting it, he can't support it because it's too divisive. Now, he explains his reasoning, or lack thereof, in an interview with Chris Wallace on Fox News, and he also just he, he hilariously tries to pretend as if he cares about democracy while opposing the one bill that fixes a lot of the issues with our democracy. Take a look and see what he has to say. You know, voting is the bedrock of our democracy, an open, fair, secured voting. We used to go around the world and explain and show and observe voting pr uh, procedures in a democracy. And now if we can't practice what we preach and we're going to basically do an overhaul, an 800 page overhaul of the voting uh, rights or what we call for the people act. And I think there's a lot of great things. I agree in that piece of legislation, but there's an awful lot of things that basically don't pertain directly to voting. So the voting rights act. So, or so now let me just, sure. I just, I just, so just to put a, a, a button on this, you will vote against that bill if it gets to the Senate floor. I think it's the wrong piece of legislation to bring our country together and unite our country. And I'm not supporting that because I think it will divide us further. I don't want to be in a country's divide any further than I'm in right now. I love my country, and I think my Democrat and Republican colleagues feel the same. If we continue to divide it and separate us more, it's not going to be united, and it's not going to be the country that we love and know, and it's going to be hard because it'll be back and forth no matter who's in power. And that's why I've been protecting so that brings the process. So because it's supported along party lines, it's too partisan, and therefore it's too divisive. The effort to rig future elections systematically that's occurring in 48 states, as that Bernie Sanders tweet pointed out, that isn't necessarily divisive. What's divisive is the effort to fix democracy. Rein in dark money in politics. Stop partisan gerrymandering. That is what's divisive to Joe Manchin. He's just a clown. And again, you can tell how unreasonable he's being because he's the only individual in the Senate who caucuses with the Democratic Party who's against this. Independents, Bernie Sanders and Angus King, support this. Kirsten Sinema even supports it. Even the most right-wing Democrats, John Tester, he supports it. It's only Joe Manchin who's choosing to side with his right-wing buddies who's against this. Now, I could say a lot about this, but I think that Jamal Bowman, in an interview with John Berman on CNN, put it best. Joe Manchin has become the new Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell, during Obama's presidency, said he would do everything in his power to stop Obama. He's also repeated that now during the Biden presidency by saying he would do everything in his power to stop President Biden. And now Joe Manchin is doing everything in his power to stop democracy and to stop our work for the people, the work that the people sent us here to do. H.R. 1 not only is a huge bill when it comes to voting rights, it's a huge bill in terms of getting big money out of politics, protecting uh, our elections against fraud, and ending gerrymandering. I mean, big money in politics is what's destroying our democracy. And the Republican Party is aiding and abetting that. And Donald Trump is obviously doing that as well. So Manchin is not pushing us closer to bipartisanship. He is doing the work of the Republican Party by being an obstructionist, just like they've been since the beginning of Biden's presidency. That's exactly right. He's the one who's being a partisan actor, but he's doing it in the name of bipartisanship so less people notice. They think that he's not being a partisan actor, but really he is a partisan actor because he's representing the interests of the party that he cares about the most, the Republican Party. I mean, his state of West Virginia, it went to Donald Trump. He contemplated voted for voting for Donald Trump back in 2020 in the event Bernie Sanders uh, was the Democratic Party's nominee. So this individual is more of a Republican than a Democrat. And so, you know, it doesn't really matter what excuse he wants to come up with. In actuality, what really this is about is him being a coward and unwilling to stand up to his corporate donors because even the most corporate Democrats support 
before the people act. But the thing that he probably doesn't like is the provision that would force super PACs to disclose their contributors, which to him is a bad thing because they want to be able to donate unanimously to both parties and they don't really want to out themselves. So, I mean, this guy is a corporate stooge. And part of it is he just, he loves the spotlight. Like, it's not just corruption. Understand that this individual absolutely loves all the attention that he's getting. He loves being the lowest common denominator. And he loves that every single piece of legislation has to be approved by him in order for it to get passed. Basically, this individual, this senator from West Virginia is the president of the United States. Joe Biden isn't doing much to rein him in. I mean, he made this like tepid condemnation of him kind of without naming him the other day. But this is going to keep happening unless Joe Biden puts his foot down. Now, Joe Biden can complain all he wants publicly, privately. But the thing is that I think that Joe Biden actually likes what Joe Manchin is doing because it gives Joe Biden plausible deniability. He doesn't like the fixes that his party wants to implement, and he's kind of being forced to at least pay lip service to some of the more progressive things. He's not standing up to people like Joe Manchin. He's not using his bully pulpit to condemn individuals like Joe Manchin, because I don't think he wants to. I think that he likes that Joe Manchin is doing this. He's taking all the heat for Joe Biden, so Joe Biden doesn't necessarily have to look like the villain in saying, I don't actually support all of these things that I ran on. I mean, either way, whatever is happening, it's disgusting. And the pressure needs to be on folks like this from the grassroots. It's unacceptable. And his constituents should absolutely be calling him and asking why he's siding more with the authoritarian party than the weak Democratic Party, who at least wants some fixes to our democracy. So back in March, the International Criminal Court announced that it'd be launching a probe into Israel over the occupation of the Palestinian territories, as well as potential war crimes. Now, at the time, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that the United States government is firmly opposed to this investigation and says that the ICC doesn't have the jurisdiction to actually investigate Israel over what is being alleged. So the question is, seeing how biased the Israeli courts are against the Palestinian people, I mean, when they're being ev evicted from their homes, Israeli courts approve it like the chance that they're winning is almost zero percent so the question is if they're not able to domestically advance their cause legally because the court system is biased against them and internationally the u.s government is against that too then what exactly are palestinians supposed to do like what avenue are they supposed to take to advance their case legally? This is a question that Representative Ilhan Omar asked to Secretary of State Antony Blinken. And as you're going to see, uh, his answer is uh, incoherent. Uh, I know you oppose the court's investigation in both um, Palestine and in Afghanistan. I haven't seen any evidence in either cases that domestic courts can uh, both can and will prosecute alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity. And I would emphasize that in Israel and Palestine, uh, this includes crimes committed by both the Israeli security forces and Hamas. In Afghanistan, it includes crimes committed by the Af Afghan national government and the Taliban. So in, in both of these cases, if domestic courts can't or won't pursue justice, and we oppose the ICC, where do we think victims are supposed to go for justice? And what justice mechanisms do you support for them? Thank, uh, thank you. Um, first, l l let me just say at the outset that um, it is impossible not to be profoundly moved by uh, not just the uh, uh, loss of life, in the recent uh, violence and, and, and conflict, uh, but especially uh, the children whose whose lives were lost, and we 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 all have a you know a tendency to throw statistics and numbers out there, but uh, we were talking about um, boys and girls, Israelis and Palestinians, uh, as well as men and women, and uh, I think uh, none of us, from whatever from whatever perspective, we we come. Uh, can can lose sight of that. So that's one thing that's that's very important. Look, I, you, you know our views on um, uh, on the ICC and its its jurisdiction. We continue to believe that absent uh, a Security Council uh, referral or absent uh, the uh, request by the uh, the state itself, 
that that's not appropriate. I continue uh, to believe that whether it is uh, the United States or Israel, uh, both of us uh, have the uh, have the means. Mr. Secretary, I, I do understand that point. I'm asking what mechanism do you think is, is available to them? I, I believe that we have, uh, whether it's the United States or Israel, we both have uh, the mechanisms to um, make, make sure that there is accountability uh, in, uh, in, in any situations where there are concerns about um, uh, the use of force uh, and uh, human rights, uh, et cetera. I believe that both of our democracies have that, uh, have that capacity, and we've demonstrated it, and uh, we'll need to continue to demonstrate it going forward. That was an abysmal response. I'm sure that the Palestinian people are super relieved to hear that the answer to the alternative for the Israeli court system uh, for them is just the Israeli court system. Oh, what's that? The Israeli court system isn't working for you? Well, um, just use the Israeli court system. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering that for me. I was really confused about what to do, but that really clarified it for me. After me asking you, what can I do because the Israeli court system isn't working for me because it's biased against Palestinians, you say, just use the Israeli court system, idiot. Oh, well, why, why didn't they think about this? Do the Palestinians know that it's that easy? And uh, like him at the beginning of that answer, prefacing his non-answer by saying, oh, well, you know, it's so devastating to see the lives that are being lost. Save it. Because as Israel is bombing Gaza, one of the most densely populated areas on the planet, you're giving them more bombs. You're defending them. So save it. You don't care. You're lying. And if you do care, then your actions indicate that you don't care. In fact, that you actually support what Israel was doing. Because, I mean, if you're giving a country that's committing war crimes more weapons, what else are we supposed to take away from that? So, I mean, this is a short video because I think that the video speaks for itself. It's a great question from Ilhan Omar, but this is an issue with the U.S. government failing to recognize the jurisdiction of the ICC. You see, no president wants to join the ICC. Bush was against it. Clinton was against it. Obama was against it. Trump was against it. Biden's against it. Now, ask yourself, why do U.S. presidents so vociferously oppose our government joining the ICC and recognizing their jurisdiction? Well, it's because in the event we actually join the ICC, how many U.S. officials would be tried for war crimes? Henry Kissinger? Cheney? Trump? Bush? Obama? I mean, by agreeing to join the ICC, essentially presidents are in a way, opening themselves up to investigations because many U.S. presidents do very terrible things that I think are clearly violations of international law. And yes, they meet the criteria for war crimes, crime, crimes against humanity. So in the event they signed on to the ICC, they're opening themselves up to a future investigation. So this is why every single U.S. president has opposed this because they want to be able to commit crimes and get away with it so it's just this is really frustrating but i'm glad that somebody asked the question because you can see how foolish a public official looks when they try to answer it there's no answer for this the answer is that he doesn't believe that palestinians should have any avenue to pursue their cause legally speaking they're just supposed to shut up and take it that's literally effectively what the u.s government is saying as many of you know by now, right-wing grifter Milo Yiannopoulos, his latest thing that he's doing is uh, he's going around telling everyone that he is an ex-gay. Now, I think it's obvious that he's lying. I very much believe that he is still a practicing homosexual, for lack of a better word. But the reason why I think he's doing this is twofold. One, I think that he's doing this to elevate his profile once again, because he's basically irrelevant now. And second of all, more importantly, I think he's doing this to be accepted back into right-wing circles. You know, he wasn't accepted into all circles on the right because he was very flamboyant, very openly homosexual. And they very much still are homophobic, even if they haven't been as vocal about it lately. Although that's kind of changing again as they embrace the conservatism of the 2000s but regardless he's claiming that he's an ex-gay now and he has definitive proof that he is on the right path because he got a sign from god 
that this is the right thing to do. And that sign from God came in the form of dogs not barking at him anymore. This is what he claims. When I made my announcement, the first thing that happened, which will make you laugh, but it's true, is dogs stopped barking at me. I am one of those people. You know, everyone's got that friend that dogs always go nuts around. You're familiar with this, right? You, you got pets? Yes. Yeah. But there's always somebody that no, dogs. My, my dog doesn't bark at you. I, I keep my dog in the. Me. But hey, crazy. Dog barked at you, but that's okay. Uh, he like uh, he barks. Well, he so, barks so, at people. You must have some work left to do. Um, but he didn't <laughs> bark at my dog. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> but but I was always one of those. I know this sounds so stupid, but this is just how I think that God reveals Himself to us, right? This is this is just my experience of it. I was somebody who invariably, without exception, always used to make dogs go crazy. So we have a friend who's a political candidate down here, right? And her campaign manager has two of these little yappy dogs and they would not stop. I couldn't be in her house for more than 20 minutes because it would drive everybody crazy. Um, even growing up, we had Alsatians, we had black Labradors. Um, they just didn't like me at all. But dogs don't bark at me anymore and it happened almost overnight. Now they seem to quite like me. And it sounds like it's the stupidest thing in the world. Oh, it sounds that way because it is. I mean, this is why, to me, religion is so silly. If God wanted to give you a sign, why would he have to do that through dogs? Why would he have to be that subtle? Why wouldn't he just open up the clouds and say, Yo, Milo, I'm glad you're not sucking dick anymore, man. Good job. Why doesn't he just do that? Like, why does he have to communicate with you through these weird measures? This is the most uh, um, um, omnipotent being in the universe. Why does he have to use dogs to communicate with you? It's so stupid. Like, this is this is delusional. And I would think that Milo Yiannopoulos is mentally unwell if I believed that he believed what he was saying. But I think it's clear he's just pandering to right-wingers. And I have to point out that he looks like Bruno when he was going through his ex-gay phase in the movie Bruno as well. Look like a straight guy. How's that? <laughs> Everyone is so fooled. <laughs> now, listen, this should go without saying by now, but there's no such thing as ex-gay. That's not a thing. And I know that to a lot of my usual viewers, that's common sense. But to a lot of people, they don't necessarily understand homosexuality. They think it's kind of something that's different than heterosexuality. But you can't just change your sexual orientation by sheer force of will, by hoping or wishing and praying enough. That's not the way that it works. So Milo Yiannopoulos can choose to try to repress his same-sex attractions. He could choose to not engage in sexual activity with men, but that doesn't change the fact that he very much is still a homosexual. And if you don't believe me, if you disagree with that premise, then you could test it right now. If you're heterosexual, just stop being straight. Force yourself to be attracted to to the same uh, sex and and like it. Go fuck someone of the same sex and like it. Enjoy it. You can't do that because you can't just force these feelings on yourself. Like, this is something that is very clearly innate. People are born gay. So, the concept of ex-gay in 2021 is so absurd that anyone who says that it's a thing should be laughed out of the room. But when you have right-wing grifters like Milo Yiannopoulos who are desperate... I mean, he'll say anything to be relevant and remain relevant. So, look, the dumbest thing about this and the biggest thing that Milo is missing is that he's assuming that dogs didn't like him because he's gay. But dogs don't like you because you're a fucking weirdo. Dogs love gay people. And I have proof of that. You love me. You love me, don't you? Okay, you love me. I love you, too. Dogs love gay people. Fuck off, Milo. Um, Representative Jamal Bowman uh, no. said that you're the new Mitch McConnell. I'm, I mean, I understand the frustration. I understand the frustration. That's, you know, that's business for you. That was Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia assuring his biggest critics that he understands how frustrating it is to watch him single-handedly torpedo one of the most important pieces of legislation in recent history, knowing that there's not a single thing you can do to stop him. I mean, look at him. He loves all of this attention that he's getting. But lucky for all of us, you know, contrary to popular belief, 
he's a reasonable guy. At least that's what he wants us to think about him, uh, because he did meet with some civil rights leaders, the president of the NAACP, Al Sharpton, and he had with them what he calls a constructive conversation, which is actually pretty encouraging to hear. So how did that go? Well, he described the meeting as a listening session where everyone described their position, telling reporters that it was a very, very good meeting. I'm very honored that we all got the chance to speak, listen to each other. That's really what it's about. We learned and we listened, he said. We had a constructive conversation. I think everybody pretty much knows the importance of what we're doing. And I think I'm very much concerned about our democracy protecting people's voting rights, Manchin added. Wow. Okay, that actually sounds... Pretty fantastic. So the question is, did he have a change of heart? Well, that would be a big no. Because asked if the meeting changed his position on S1, known as the For the People Act, he added, no, I don't think anybody changed their position on that. In other words, after he met with civil rights leaders who explained the importance of voting rights to him, he still was unmoved. But look, he's in a really difficult position. Like, this is one of the few Democratic senators who comes from a very deep red state that went overwhelmingly to Donald Trump in 2020. So what he has to do is he has to walk this fine line and he has to do things, make these hard decisions, go against his own party to appease his constituents. Except that's not actually a valid excuse because people in West Virginia overwhelmingly support the For the People Act, including the overwhelming majority of Donald Trump voters in 2020. So that's not actually a viable excuse, but this time he's not using that excuse, to be fair. This time he's saying he can't support the For the People Act, something that he actually co-sponsored back in 2019, because this time it's just too partisan. Last time it was still partisan, it was supported along party lines, but this time he just, he feels a little bit different about this. So the question is, why is he all of a sudden having a change of heart? This is something that his constituents support. His party overwhelmingly supports it. And on top of that, he supported it before. So he changed his mind at some point. Why? Well, this article should clear it up. Quote, Joe Manchin is opposing big parts of Biden's agenda as the Koch network pressures him. Author Brian Schwartz explains the political advocacy group backed by billionaire Charles Koch has been pressuring Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia to oppose key parts of the Democratic agenda, including filibuster reform and voting rights legislation. That lobbying effort appears to be paying off. Manchin, in a recent op-ed, wrote that he opposed eliminating the filibuster and that he would not vote for the For the People Act, which advocates say would limit the influence of big donors on elections. CNBC reviewed an episode of a Koch policy group, Americans for Prosperity's video series, along with ads crafted by the organization. The network specifically calls on its grassroots supporters to push Manchin, a conservative Democrat, to be against some of his party's legislative priorities. Americans for Prosperity launched a website titled West Virginia Values, which calls on people to email Manchin to be the voice West Virginia needs in D.C., reject Washington's partisan agenda. So it's interesting to me that they're specifically yelling at him right now, reject the partisan agenda in Washington, D.C., and he's literally rejecting the Democratic Party's agenda on partisan grounds. He's actually copying the rhetoric that they're using. So, I mean, obviously the lobbying has been effective, but that's what it is. He's corrupt. He's being influenced by the Koch network, and as a result of their lobbying... He's buckling to that pressure. He doesn't care about what the people of West Virginia wants. He doesn't care about what the people in America overwhelmingly want. This is all about the Koch brothers. Because part of the For the People Act would ensure that super PACs have to disclose their private donors. And the Koch network, it operates. The reason why it's so effective is because it does all of this through these covert methods, right? Anonymous donors, dark money. And so the For the People Act, it's not the end-all be-all, but it would solve some of the issues with our democracy. And the Koch network doesn't want that to happen, which is why they're putting all of this pressure on one of the most spineless senators, knowing that he'd be pretty easy to break. And they were right about that. So the media needs to stop pretending as if Joe Manchin is some maverick who, you know, is above the fray and he's rejecting this hyper-partisan culture in D.C. and he's just doing what's right for his constituents. He's making a decision based on his own opinion. No, this is a stooge who represents large multinational corporations and whoever is in his ear the loudest. 
that's how you can predict the behavior of Joe Manchin. And it doesn't hurt that he's getting all of this attention, which you can tell he's he's enjoying it. He's soaking it in. But it's disgusting. This is why he's doing what he's doing. People in media need to stop pretending as if he's operating on the basis of principle. This individual has no political ideology. He has no principles. He's corrupt. Period. End of story. Occam's razor. That's the easiest explanation. I mean, if you're wondering why he changed his position so quickly in 2019, supporting the For the People Act, and in 2021, single-handedly torpedoing it, it's because he's quite literally a sellout. I know that that word gets used a lot and it gets thrown around a lot, particularly in uh, leftist circles online, but he is like the definition of a sellout. And everyone who lives in West Virginia should be furious. They should be uh, calling his office, emailing him, letting him know that he's not representing their interests. He's representing the interests of corporate America, in particular, the right-wing donor network that's fucking over normal Americans, especially people in West Virginia who suffer from a lack of education, jobs, and healthcare. He's siding with the oligarchs and not the people of West Virginia, and he should absolutely be shamed and named until he breaks. So I want to take some time to examine some headlines because when you look at all of these headlines in total, I think it tells us a really important story that a lot of folks, particularly on the left, are missing. So this is back from uh, February. It was published in Politico. It reads, Biden administration backs DeVos in fight over testifying about loan forgiveness. The Justice Department joined with DeVos to fight a subpoena as part of a class action lawsuit brought on behalf of some 160,000 former for-profit college students. And more recently, Biden DOJ will defend excluding Puerto Ricans from disability payments. And finally, the grand finale, Biden Justice Department defends Trump in suit over rape denial. The new administration is pressing on with a controversial stance in a defamation case brought by writer E. Jean Carroll. Yeah, that's going to be a big yikes for me. Now, you can argue that it's a long-standing practice. It's basically a tradition for administrations to defend the constitutionality of federal laws, even if that administration doesn't necessarily agree with the federal law that they're defending. They're just doing this because this is what they've always done. This is basically uh, the reasoning that Biden's administration gave for why they're defending legally the exclusion of Puerto Ricans from disability payments. But this isn't always the case. There have been times where a president has broken with tradition. For example, we've seen countless times Donald Trump refused to defend the Affordable Care Act from multiple right-wing legal challenges. We've seen Obama refuse to defend the Defense of Marriage Act in court. So there have been times where administrations have broken with tradition. But if there's any time where you definitely want to break with tradition, you'd think it'd be here where Biden's administration wouldn't want to defend Trump over allegations of rape. But they're choosing to defend Trump when they don't have to. So the question is, why? Why is Joe Biden's administration doing this? What's the justification that they're giving for this? Because it seems like this is really unjustifiable. Well, Politico breaks it down. In the filing with the New York-based Second U.S. Court of Appeals, the Justice Department insisted that it was not endorsing Trump's conduct toward writer E. Jean Carroll, even as it argued that a law governing suits against federal officials justified the government's move to take over the former president's defense in the case. Boynton, who's the acting head of the DOJ's civil division, by the way, also adhered to the stance the Justice Department adopted in the case last September that Trump was acting in the course of his official duty as president when he denied Carol's rape allegations from more than two decades ago. Doesn't really make it any better. So in essence, what they're saying is that there is a level of immunity that courts uh, grant to government officials and the DOJ is simply granting that same uh, luxury to Donald Trump here, even if, you know, the accusations are egregious, even if Donald Trump is very clearly a fraud and there are numerous allegations of sexual misconduct against him well like other government officials he also gets the same privilege as biden or obama or bush would get now this is a bad argument uh, just to put it mildly but we're not even scratching the surface because if you're shocked at this here 
then if you just dig a little bit, you'll see how terrible the Department of Justice has been under the leadership of Merrick Garland, who was appointed by Joe Biden. This is all part of a larger trend that speaks to how terrible Merrick Garland is. The New Republic reports, on several key matters, Garland's DOJ has concealed the full extent of Trump's wrongdoing. It has kept thousands of immigrants from obtaining green cards while flooding the immigration system with Trump-selected judges, expanded the scope of police power, ensured oil and gas profits for decades to come, and explicitly protected one of Trump's most hated cabinet secretaries from accountability. Indeed, Garland has quietly emerged as Donald Trump's unwitting hatchet man, doing almost everything in his power to protect the lawless former president's legacy. Late last month, the Justice Department urged a federal judge to dismiss lawsuits against Trump and former Attorney General Bill Barr over their decision to tear gas Black Lives Matter protesters near the White House last summer so that the president would be able to take a photo near a church holding the Bible upside down. While Garland repeated throughout his confirmation process that he'd prioritize tackling white supremacy almost six months into the administration, no part of the federal government has a plan for rooting out white supremacists who serve in federal law enforcement roles. Meanwhile, Garland's DOJ is actively defending a new oil project in Alaska that was cleared under Trump's shams of environmental tests and may generate new oil for 30 years. In its filing, the DOJ explicitly said that the Trump administration adequately considered the new site's effect on wildlife and greenhouse gas emissions. Garland is also maintaining support for a new oil pipeline in New Jersey and isn't rescinding Trump era briefs that made it harder for states to sue big oil over downplaying the risks of climate change. Oh, and Garland's still shielding Trump's tax returns from Congress. Why is Garland doing all of this? To be clear, he is not secretly a devout Trumpist who's wiggled his way into the highest levels of the Democratic Party. Rather, Garland is doing exactly what his most ardent supporters said he would upon his nomination, leading the Department of Justice the way he remembers it from his first DOJ stint in the 1990s. So basically, the reason why Merrick Garland is so terrible in a nutshell is because it's tradition for an administration to maintain all of the same legal positions as their predecessor. It doesn't matter that the last president used the DOJ as his own personal wing of government to defend himself from allegations of corruption, fraud, and alleged sex crimes. I mean, the last administration did all of these things, so we have to maintain tradition and do exactly what they did. You see, this is why nothing changes and gets done in America, and this is why each administration continues to get worse and worse. Why we see the precedent being built upon when it comes to, you know, spying on Americans, warrantless wiretapping, and other violations of civil rights and civil liberties. It's because, well, the last administration did it, so let's... uh. Let's do that same thing. This is also basically the ratchet effect in action because even if Donald Trump, more often than uh, I think other presidents, you could argue, was willing to, you know, shun traditions to benefit himself, well, Democrats, they adopt all of the terrible legal positions that the Trump administration took and they're going to do that going forward. And the next uh, Republican administration is probably going to adopt some pretty terrible legal positions. And then the next Democratic administration subsequently will adopt those terrible legal positions. And then slowly but surely, we keep gradually shifting to the right. It's just it's deeply frustrating. But this explains why Merrick Garland is so goddamn terrible. And it's frustrating because there's no reason for Biden to even nominate someone like Merrick Garland in the first place. But the reason why he was nominated, I think, is because, well, this individual was nominated by Obama to be a Supreme Court nominee, and Republicans stole that seat. So this is his kind of, like, gotcha to Republicans. No, you know, you rejected Merrick Garland, but we're going to find a position for him in our cabinet. And, you know, it's based off of uh, that, I guess. I mean, that's probably... in overly simplified reading of the situation but long story short Merrick Garland is absolute trash and individuals who try to follow this like really rigid traditionalist view of the American legal system all they're doing is moving us backwards ProPublica has obtained lots and lots of documents from the IRS and they conducted an analysis and basically the conclusion of this analysis is that we need a wealth tax yesterday. And of course, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but when you read the details here and you look at some of the information that they provide us with, it is absolutely clear that there's no way we're going to solve the issue of income and wealth inequality unless we take drastic action 
and introduce legislation like a wall tax. So they explain, ProPublica has obtained a vast trove of Internal Revenue Service data on the tax returns of thousands of the nation's wealthiest people, covering more than 15 years. The data provides an unprecedented look inside the financial lives of America's titans, including Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Rupert Murdoch, and Mark Zuckerberg. It shows not just their income and taxes, but also their investments, stock trades, gambling winnings, and even the results of audits. Taken together, it demolishes the cornerstone myth of the American tax system, that everyone pays their fair share and the richest Americans pay the most. The IRS records show that the wealthiest can, perfectly legally, pay income taxes that are only a tiny fraction of the hundreds of millions, if not billions, their fortunes grow each year. To capture the financial reality of the richest Americans, ProPublica undertook an analysis that has never been done before. We compared how much in taxes the 25 richest Americans paid each year to how much Forbes estimated their wealth grew in that same time period. We're going to call this their true tax rate. The results are stark. According to Forbes, those 25 people saw their worth rise a collective $401 billion from 2014 to 2018. They paid a total of $13.6 billion in federal income taxes in those five years, the IRS data shows. That's a staggering sum, but it amounts to a true tax rate of only 3.4%. Now let's look at the four richest Americans and what they claimed their income was, what they paid in taxes, but most importantly, how much their wealth grew in this four-year period. Warren Buffett, for example, reported $125 million in income, and he paid $23.7 million in federal taxes over that same four-year period. So it sounds reasonable at first, right? However, when you look at how much his wealth grew by, 24.3% billion dollars in four years, making what they call his true tax rate 0.1%. Yeah. Jeff Bezos reported $4.22 billion in income and paid $973 million in taxes, but his wealth grew by $99 billion, making his true tax rate 0.98%. Michael Bloomberg reported $10 billion. He paid $292 million in taxes, but his wealth grew by $22.5 billion, making his true tax rate 1.3%. And finally, Elon Musk reported $1.5 billion, paid $400 million. $155 million in taxes, but saw his wealth grow by nearly $14 billion, making his true tax rate 3.27%. So in effect, this is why the gap between normal Americans and the richest Americans continues to grow. Now, I want to show you an image that really, uh, I think, perfectly demonstrates how unfair this system is. While Bezos' wealth has grown astronomically over the last decade, and he's paid a minuscule fraction of it in taxes, a typical American household paid more in taxes than it accumulated in wealth. So they might argue that we're paying our fair share. I paid millions of dollars in taxes. And that's technically true. I mean, if you look at their uh, tax rate in comparison with their income, for a particular year, sure, maybe they pay like 14 to 18 percent, as is the case with that chart we just saw. However, when you look at their wealth and how fast their wealth is growing, the rate at which they're able to accumulate wealth, seemingly exponential, I mean, that's when you get the full story. But still, like, this is a lot of numbers, and I think that the article did its best job by providing us with this visualizer that tries to put everything into perspective and let you see. Point blank, just how egregious this is. Wealth and income work very differently for the ultra wealthy than they do for most people. This represents $100 of income for a typical wage earning American household. The federal government taxes income. A typical American household might pay something like 14%. For many households, the rest of their income goes toward expenses every year with maybe a small amount left over for savings. A typical household might also own a home, which often grows in value over time. Such asset gains make up much of that household's wealth growth for any given year. This proportion of wealth growth versus taxes has been typical for middle-aged Americans since the mid-2000s. However, it's inverted for the ultra-wealthy. This represents $100 of income for Bezos. From 2006 to 2018, his taxes were about 21% of his income. But for people in this stratosphere, income doesn't really matter. Bezos Amazon shares have skyrocketed in value since 2006. In most years, his wealth grew far more than what he reported in income to the IRS. 
between 2006 and 2018, Bezos' wealth shot up by over $120 billion while he paid a minuscule proportion in taxes. Meanwhile, typical Americans his age paid more in taxes than they saw in wealth growth over that period. That is, for every $100 of wealth growth over that period, typical Americans paid $160 in taxes. Bezos paid only $1.09. Obviously, the solution is we need to tax the fuck out of the rich. Confiscate that wealth that they stole from their workers. We need a wealth tax. And it might not necessarily be politically feasible at this time in the current shape of American politics. But understand that the issue of income and wealth inequality isn't actually going to get better unless we take drastic action. And anyone who purports to be against the widening gap between the rich and the poor, if they're not proposing something like a wealth tax or confiscatory measures, literally, then they're not serious about alleviating this problem. Caitlyn Jenner desperately wants to be taken seriously after polls from California show that she doesn't really have a shot, but she's not backing down. So she went on national television and yet again made a fool of herself. Take a look. Joining me now is the Republican candidate for governor of California, Caitlyn Jenner. Caitlyn, good to see you. Often that's all I get. Uh oh, we might not have any audio in Caitlyn Jenner's ear. Do we have any audio, guys? Okay. Wrong video. This is the video that I actually wanted to play for you. Landed on Omaha Beach on D-Day and was awarded the Blonde Star and the Purple Heart. He served until the end of the war and was honorably discharged in 1945. Caitlyn Jenner is running to replace Governor Newsom in California and joins me now. Caitlyn, great to have you with us. Thanks for being here. Well, what's your response? Uh, you know, does this seem like an innocent mistake to you or is this a significant blunder? Uh, I'm so disappointed. Uh, in the direction that our country is going right now, down this socialist road, trying to destroy uh, this country's history. I'm very proud of our country's history. Um, from the 1619 Project, we're teaching in schools to the president of the United States of America, not even acknowledging what happened on June 6th. To me, that is absolutely devastating. My father was 19 years old, um, and he wanted to go fight. Um, he joined the 5th Ranger Battalion, went over, trained. The 5th Ranger Battalion was the first boats on Omaha Beach. Um, there was 364 guys in his division, and 60 came back alive to fight for my freedom, this country's freedom. They are truly the greatest generation. And to see the president of the United States not even acknowledge that. My father's born at our, is, is buried at Arlington with all his war buddies. Uh, if he could see what's happening to this country right now, yeah, it'd be devastated. I, I hear that a lot uh, from veterans, and thank you for your father's service. We have a wonderful picture of him up on the screen right now. You probably can't see it, but um, it, it just speaks volumes looking at this picture of your dad. Um, it, the president did the next day on, Jan on June 7th. Um, he tweeted to transgender Americans across the country, especially the young people who are so brave. I want you to know your president has your back. I'm, I'm sure I would imagine that that's a sentiment that you are pleased to hear from the president. But the fact that he talked about their bravery the day after D-Day and, and never mentioned uh, your dad and the others, what do you say about that? Um, I'm certainly not running as a trans candidate for governor of the state of California. Mm. Um, uh, I am running because I just I love this state. Um, I moved here. In 1973, 48 years ago, a long time ago, uh, when gas was 39 cents a gallon. Uh, today, taxes are over 50 cents a gallon. Mm -hmm. I have watched over the last 48 years this state decline um, because of Sacramento has been ambushed by the socialists for a lot longer than the, the United States. We've been going down this road for a long time. And the decline is only accelerated uh, under Gavin Newsom's rule. And I thought to myself, because of my father, he served. Maybe this is my time to serve. Maybe this is time to stand up. Can I be an example 
um, to other people, if you don't like what's going on in this country right now, mm -hmm. stand up, run for your local school board. Um, you don't like what's going yeah. on in your town? Run for mayor. All right. I, I, um, it's time to stand up. We, ha we have to change things. Caitlyn Jenner, thank you. We're <sighs> I don't even know where to begin. Um, there's so much about that clip that was just silly. Uh, first of all, notice that the Fox host tried to bait her into attacking transgender people and uh, basically get her to downplay the importance of transgender issues as a trans woman because that's what Fox News tries to do. They bring on black people to attack Black Lives Matter. They bring on gay people to attack gay rights. So they're trying to do this with Caitlyn Jenner, trying to get her to say, uh, yes, actually, I do believe that Biden speaking about D-Day is more important than him speaking about transgender issues. But she didn't take the bait. And it's not because she's super savvy and she was on to the games that the host was trying to play. It's because she's an airhead and she didn't get what she was on there for. And then she went on some like weird side tangent. Listen, Caitlin, I'll make this easy for you. Whenever you're on Fox News, they want you to just attack trans people. Period. End of story. I know that that seems like super reductionist, but that's literally the only reason why they're bringing you on. Republicans, for whatever reason, have chosen to make transgender issue their number one issue. They've introduced so many bills in 2021 alone to not only ban gender affirming care to trans youth, but ban uh, transgender high school girls from school sports. So if they're bringing you on, just assume that they want you to say something terrible about trans people. But she went on some weird tangent about how California is socialist. But before we get to that, I just have to say she literally cried because Joe Biden didn't acknowledge D-Day. I just I don't understand how people get this offended by things like she literally on national television cried because the president didn't make a particular noise with his mouth that she wanted him to make. I mean, if this is a scandal, then I mean the threshold is really, really low. You know, to me, I would be more offended with other things that Joe Biden doesn't do. For example, he doesn't support Medicare for all as thousands of people die in America. And he even backed away from a public option. I would be more offended at him not acknowledging the healthcare crisis than just paying lip service to something that you already know about, right? I mean, if you're going to cry on national television over something that Joe Biden doesn't say or address, wouldn't it be something that affects people right now? I mean, sure, you can you can expect the president to speak on the anniversary of D-Day, but it's it's really obvious that this is a manufactured scandal that all of the right wing networks collectively are talking about. And it's like it's like they're all this hive mind. Is this really something you care about that much? Is this really that important to you? If it is, OK. But, I mean, we're not going to take you seriously if you literally are so affected by this that you fucking cry on television, Caitlyn Jenner, Jesus Christ. But she then goes on to say that, you know, this is her time to serve. Her grandfather served. But now it's her time to serve. And she wants to prove that socialism is not the route. I mean, a lot of you are worried about socialism now, but they've been doing socialism in California for a lot longer. And Gavin Newsom is... A socialist. I mean, the things that Republicans say about Democrats is so bizarre. I wish that what they said about Democrats, what they believed to be true about Democrats, was actually true. Because in reality, Gavin Newsom, ideologically speaking, is closer to her than he is to me. He's not a socialist, Caitlin. First of all, define socialism and then explain specifically why you think the policies that he's implementing are socialist. But he's not a socialist. He's a capitalist. Most Democrats, the overwhelming majority of Democrats, 99.99% are neoliberal. Do we know what a neoliberal is, children? It's a capitalist economic ideology. Rather than proposing public solutions to public problems, we propose private solutions to public problems. We privatize governance. Rather than having the government, for example, improve our education system, we simply defund education, for example, and we outsource that to private corporations who profit off of education. Rather than just guaranteeing healthcare to every single American, well, we allow insurance companies to rip us off. That's called neoliberalism. The Democratic Party is in lockstep with that ideology. To not be neoliberal is an exception if you're a Democrat. So when she says things like, oh, well, Gavin Newsom is uh, a socialist. No, he's quite literally a capitalist. 
it's just it's so infuriating to see words like socialist and Marxist thrown around by idiots like Caitlyn Jenner, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Donald Trump, all of Republicans. They use the word socialism as a pejorative, as a synonym for bad or stupid, but they don't actually know what it means. Look, if you are a normal person, then I think it's fine if you use socialism as you know a synonym for stupid if you say i don't like the sandwich the sandwich is pretty socialist okay you sound stupid but i mean you're a normal person so i can give you a pass if you're a politician and you want to be the governor of california you can't use political terms like this because that tells me that you don't know what the fuck they mean and don't know what the fuck you're talking about so i mean i i continue to be amused by caitlin jenner's stupidity she's like three times my age, so you'd think she'd have more wisdom. She'd know at least a little bit about basic public policy, but she knows nothing. She thinks that Gavin Newsom, a milquetoast neoliberal Democrat, is a socialist. And I mean, like, what she doesn't realize is that the people who you can point to who self-identify as socialists, like AOC and Bernie Sanders, if you look at the policy positions that they're advocating for, most Americans agree with those policies. So is, like, all of America socialists are they just like brainwashed into this socialist cult i would love to ask caitlin jenner these questions but um you know she'll just continue to uh make a fool of herself on national television and we can only speculate but um this is not someone who's very bright but i'd say she is exhibiting a level of intelligence that's probably pretty average if not above average for republican policymakers so there's that silver lining, I guess. <laughs> well, it's a brand new week, so that means, of course, that there's something new that all of conservatives are collectively outraged over. I think that we finally moved past the uh, Mr. Potato Head controversy, and we're beyond the cat in the hat kerfuffle. But now the new source of outrage on the right is uh, Blue's Clues and Nickelodeon, apparently. So they posted a video to their YouTube channel titled The Blues Clues Pride Parade Sing-Along featuring Nina West. And I don't know if this aired on television, but regardless, you can see just its existence on YouTube set off a firestorm. They disabled comments. The like to dislike ratio is like 50-50. I mean, it's obvious conservatives are very, very offended by this. And one conservative who chose to speak up and condemn this is Emily Jashinsky, who is the newest conservative populist co-host on the hill tv's rising show and she writes nothing to see here just the educated elite using their corporate platforms responsibly yes because it's so irresponsible to teach children to not hate gay and trans people is that is that really what you're concerned with she's a conservative populist but yet she's espousing 2000s bush era traditional family values rhetoric very very populist of you i mean I believe that she was sent there to normalize Sagar and Jetty, to make him look intelligent, because Lord knows every conservative populist that I've come across so far sounds just like every other Republican, except sometimes they say corporations bad. But I mean, you're kind of in lockstep with what the rest of the Republican Party wants, and you're siding with them in this culture war which they have to wage because they don't offer any substantive policy. So, I mean, it's just a joke, but I don't want to beat up on Emily too much because there were other conservatives who were offended by something else that Nickelodeon did. They posted a song about gay pride, uh, I think to their YouTube channel, and Newsmax absolutely could not handle this. Take a look. All right, Isabella, I'm going to give you a doozy. It seems like Nickelodeon has gone off the deep end. I, I don't understand what it is with, with not that I have anything against gay people, whatever it may be, but their transgender indoctrination to kids is just out in left field. Watch this video from Nickelodeon. Do you understand the amount of questions parents are going to get after that? I don't get what it is, Isabella. Do you? 
No, and it's a really, I just can't imagine it being anything besides some sinister motives. But something that really bothers me is I, I don't hate, like, like you said, I don't have a problem with gay people. I don't care about transgender people. My problem is that you're shoving it down everyone's throats. And I reject any Pride Month that is just celebrating identity politics. That is bigotry. And I just that's why I don't like the idea of a Pride Month, whether it's for any sort of topic or identity group. So this is creepy and makes me never want to have kids because I don't want to bring them into a world where this is being pushed on them. And it's scary, including critical race theory in public schools. Well, you know, that is another issue we covered on this program is that more and more people your age are not wanting to have children, which is going to create a huge budget crisis for the United States <laughs> come time when we need them paying taxes. But that's a whole other story. All of this commotion over a fucking cartoon. Yeah. I mean, I just, I don't understand it. Like these folks need a hobby. Find something better to do with your time than to like look for things to be outraged over. Isn't this what you say that we do on the left? And here you are getting outraged over a cartoon. I mean, look, that's not to say that I wouldn't dislike a cartoon targeting children. Like I spoke out against Prager Hughes videos where they're trying to indoctrinate kindergartners with right wing misinformation. That's bad. But I don't get outraged over it. I just think, OK, that's that's stupid. But these folks literally get angry over it. Like you can see in their face, like they're trying to hold it in. But it's basically that meme, the Wojak of like the uh, the happy face mask on when behind the mask, they're crying. That's what these folks are. And they both said there, uh, well, I don't hate gay people. That last host said, uh, I don't hate gay people. I don't have a problem with transgender people. They want us to think, oh, well, thank God that they don't hate gay people. We definitely needed their affirmation. But we fucking hate you. Like, I don't speak for every single gay person, but I think I speak for at least 99.98% of the LGBTQ plus community when I say we fucking can't stand you. We hate you and we don't accept you. So you might not hate us, but we can't stand you. Fuck you. But uh, I mean, what a snowflakey thing to say. I just don't want it to be shoved down our throats. What's being shoved down your throats? It's like a couple of songs, some extra rainbow logos from large multinational corporations like once a year during Pride Month. Is that really tantamount to them shoving it down your throats? I mean, that's such a snowflakey thing to say. By that same standard, I could say, look, I'm tired of heterosexuality being shoved down my throat. Because every time you watch a movie, there's always straight couples and they're kissing. Every single romantic comedy is basically, you know, a guy and a girl. Every time I, you know, come into contact with one of my um, my siblings, they talk about their their opposite sex spouse. Stop shoving it down my throat. Oh. No, I don't say that because I'm not a fucking snowflake. I'm not a snowflake. But to them, they don't like being reminded that gay people exist. And really what this is about is they think, incorrectly so, that if children are taught not to hate gay people, that it's going to make their kids turn gay. Like, it's not that they don't want those values instilled into their children because that that's part of it. Like they want to teach their kids that gay bad, but there's also another layer to their stupidity. They literally believe that if you teach children to accept gay and trans people, that they're going to be gay and trans. You're going to think, oh, that looks cool. I'm going to be gay now, but that's not the way that it, that it works, but that's like conservative logic for you. They're stupid and they don't understand it. So that's really what this is about. That's what the hysteria is over. It's the same reason why back in the 60s, conservatives didn't want to accept interracial marriage because they believed that once you open that door, then all of a sudden, all of your white daughters are going to want to marry black men. That's literally the scare tactic that they used. And it's so ironic to me that they claim to be against identity politics. They focus almost exclusively on identity politics, but then simultaneously they'll denounce identity politics. Just like being aware that gay people exist in and of itself, that's not identity politics. What you're doing, ironically, is in fact identity politics. This antiquated culture war bullshit that your party keeps rehashing, that is identity politics, dummy. And you focus on this while the rest of society moves on and accepts gay people and trans people. But because your party and ideology are morally bankrupt and you have zero policy solutions, you focus on wedge issues like this and you try to gin up hatred against gay and trans people. And yet you claim, oh, well, you know, we're not against gay and trans people. We just don't want it shoved down our throats. Shut the fuck up, you snowflakes. Prove to us that you don't hate gay people. Prove to us that you're not snowflakes. Prove to us that you yourself are not trying to engage in cancel culture by canceling like Blue's Clues or get them to remove this video. Prove to us that you're better than us. 
prove to us that you're better than you say we are by shutting the fuck up about things like this. Mr. Potato Head, Cat in the Hat, Blue's Clues, pick a serious issue, just one, and maybe focus on that for a change. Jesus Christ. Conservatives are so fucking brain dead. So I want to talk about a trend that we see every single year in the month of June, rainbow washing. And to me, this is really irritating because what's happening, uh, and this is not like uncommon in a late stage capitalist society, but what's happening is we're seeing the co-optation of pride by large multinational corporations. And it's irritating because like to me, as an out and proud member of the LGBTQ plus community, maybe I want to change like the Humanist Report logo to the rainbow flag or something like that. But I feel like, oh, if I'm if I'm doing that, I'm virtue signaling to the extent that large multinational corporations are. And I want to be more substantive than that. But I mean, like these little gestures, I think, are important. Like the rainbow flag is something that we should be proud of. But yet these large corporations... It's like they hijacked it. And to me, there's something so inherently gross about that. And I'm seeing more and more members of the LGBTQ plus community speak out against this because it this isn't their thing. They're very clearly trying to cash in on pride because it's trendy now when they wouldn't say anything when gay people were actually fighting for equality. During the 2000s, you'd never see Levi's or whatever this company is or AT&T speak out in favor of gay rights, but now that it's socially acceptable, well, they do it because they know they can make money off of it. And the worst part about all of this is that conservatives use this, this rainbow washing as evidence that corporations are woke. And it's, it's all super frustrating, but I wanna show you that these corporations, they're not actually woke. All they're doing is they're LARPing as LGBTQ plus allies and it's time that we say, no, fuck off. I reject this. We don't accept you being a fake ass ally. So Nathan Place of The Independent writes, Walmart, Amazon, and McDonald's have all donated to members of Congress who voted against the Equality Act. According to Insider, Comcast, UPS, and AT&T have each donated over $2 million to anti-gay politicians. According to Forbes, the list goes on. And all of these companies have declared their support for Pride. This month, we'll be celebrating and highlighting the people within our McDonald's family that embody the spirit of LGBT. LGBTQ plus pride, McDonald's tweeted on June 1st. Happy Pride Month. Here's how we're celebrating the LGBTQ community across our organization, Comcast tweeted on the same day. Forbes also listed six other corporations that it says have donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to anti-LGBT politicians. Home Depot, General Electric, FedEx, UBS, Verizon, and Pfizer. All six of these have voiced their support for gay rights as well. A spokesperson for Amazon defended the donations, saying the retailer engages with policymakers and regulators on a wide range of issues. That does not mean we agree with any individual or political organization 100% of the time on every issue, the company explained. And this includes legislation that discriminates or encourages discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community. Separately, Pfizer defended its donations to Republicans as well. The decision to contribute to these elected officials was made based on their support of the biopharmaceutical industry and policies that protect innovation incentives and patients' access to medicines and vaccines, just say deregulation and patent protection. The company told Forbes, in no way does our support translate into an endorsement of their position on any social issue. UPS made a similar case for its own donations. Few policymakers agree with each other or businesses 100% of the time, nor do we agree with 100% of the congressional members' opinions, it told Forbes. Meanwhile, the rainbow logos continue to shine. Yeah, so this is irritating to me because they very clearly want to have it both ways. On one hand, they want to continue to fund anti-gay and anti-trans politicians because they want their tax breaks, they don't want to be regulated, but they also want to wear the rainbow flag and make money off of LGBTQ plus customers, sell LGBTQ plus merch, and, you know, have it both ways. But no, LGBTQ plus people need to put their foot down and say, if you're not going to support us unconditionally and unequivocally, you don't get to rep the fucking rainbow flag. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but we're going to call you out for it because you're funding politicians who are fucking over the lives of gay and trans people. You're donating to Republicans in states that have passed more trans bills than any other year in recent history. 
And yet you want us to believe that you support LGBTQ plus people? No, fuck you. You're trying to hijack pride to cash in on it. And I reject that. Every single gay person should reject this. And whenever a large multinational corporation does something like this and tries to virtue signal to cultivate goodwill with LGBTQ plus people, we need to call them out. And I love it because I saw Representative Pramila Jayapal, who I have my issues with on some issues, do exactly what I just advocated for. So she tweeted out in response to J.P. Morgan Chase making a pro-gay, pro-pride statement. She says this, J.P. Morgan Chase and co. donated $41,727 to Mitch McConnell's 2020 campaign while he is actively blocking the Equality Act from becoming law. But nice pride post. She also says, what a fun pride display. But what's not fun is that American Airlines donated $46,617 to Mitch McConnell's 2020 campaign while he was actively blocking the Equality Act from becoming law. And last one here, she says AT&T donated $56,295 to Mitch McConnell's 2020 campaign while he was actively blocking the Equality Act. But what a great pride Twitter banner. So I love the sarcasm there. Yeah, and that's just it. They want to wear the rainbow flag as they fuck us over. I mean, with friends like this, who needs enemies? Now, that's not to say that some companies aren't trying to do a good job, but still, you can't sit with us. To quote Mean Girls, you can't sit with us. Stop trying to take over something, especially if you're just LARPing as LGBTQ allies. You're not real allies if you're funding politicians that fuck over LGBTQ plus people. And whenever, every single June, we see these corporations change their logo to the rainbow flag, we have to call them out, look up the donations, see which politicians they contributed to, and call them the fuck out because this is disgusting. This is phony. It's fake. And I hate it. I, I absolutely, unequivocally reject this rainbow washing. The state of Ohio has been tremendously successful in reducing vaccine hesitancy. And part of their state's success, I think, hinges on a brilliant plan to create a vaccine lottery. So that way, anyone above the age of 16 who gets the vaccine is automatically enrolled in a state lottery and they could win $1 million. I believe there's five winners and I think that Ohio is the first state to do this. Many states have since followed suit because the program is incredibly successful. After this rolled out, vaccinations jumped by 33% in Ohio, and the first winner, who's an Amazon delivery driver, says that he was vaccinated specifically because of the lottery. So I think that this is brilliant. I think that every single state should follow suit. We've talked about this on the program before, but of course, anti-vax, pro-pandemic Republicans are now trying to stop their state's successful vaccine program. They introduced House Bill 248, which is a so-called vaccine choice bill. And what this would do is ban any requirements in public settings for vaccines and also not even allow the state government to incentivize vaccine programs. So it's already a choice, but they're trying to pass this bill, which assumes that it's not already a choice and they don't even want the government to incentivize getting the vaccine. They don't want the government, which has a responsibility to make sure that public health is taken care of, to incentivize good public health choices. So this is what's in the bill. House Bill 248, co-sponsored by 16 House Republicans, would prohibit any of the following institutions from mandating, incentivizing, or otherwise requesting their employees, customers, or students get vaccinated. Businesses, hospitals, nursing homes, colleges, daycare centers, and insurers. Yeah. So they held a hearing on this bill in the Ohio House Public Health Committee, and naturally, it attracted lots and lots of weirdos, and some very strange assertions and demonstrations were made throughout the course of uh, this hearing, and um, it's very entertaining. Take a look. And some of the information that I think had been discussed on your podcast related to EMF frequencies, that was a thought. And, and it was you, I mean, because now because right now that? we're all kind of um, hypothesizing. I mean, what is it that's actually being transmitted that's causing all of these things? Is it a combination of the protein, which now we're finding has a metal attached to it? I'm sure you've seen the pictures all over the internet of people who've had these shots, and now they're magnetized. 
They can put a key on their forehead, it sticks. They can put spoons and forks all over them and they can stick because now we think that there's a metal piece to that. There has been people who've long suspected that there was some sort of an interface, yet to be defined, an interface between what's being injected in these shots and all of the 5G towers. Not proven yet, but we're trying to figure out what is it that's being transmitted to these unvaccinated people. Yes, vaccines do harm people. By the way, so I just found out something when I was on lunch, and I wanted to show it to you. We were talking about Dr. Tenpenny's testimony about magnetic vaccine crystals. So this is what I found out. So I have a key and a bobby pin here. Explain to me why the key sticks to me. It sticks to my neck, too. Got those. Yeah, so if somebody can explain this, that would be great. Any questions? Well, I, for one, am thoroughly convinced there's no other explanation. She's just magnetic. And look, as someone who's been fully vaccinated, I would kind of view this as having a superpower. I think it'd be awesome to be magnetic. So I'm going to give it a try because she convinced me. So let's see if it works. I have a spoon here. And I'm going to try to stick it to my body because I should be magnetic, according to her. So here we go. It's touching my skin. And on a count of three, I'm going to let go. One, two, three. Fuck. Let's try it again. Nope. Didn't work that time. Okay. Let's try sticking it to my arm. It's not working, but <laughs> there's got to be an explanation. Why did it work on her, but it's not working on me? It's almost as if there is actually a scientific reason for that. Well, a very polite chemistry teacher chimed in and said, Hi, I, a chemistry teacher, can explain this. It can't be magnetism because the key is brass, which isn't attracted to magnets. The answer is likely surface tension and capillary action. Flat objects stick to damp surfaces, which is why it doesn't work on your neck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this has to be explained to grown adults. Now, throughout the course of that video, I love the reaction from the lady who was very, very confused and was seemingly horrified as the lady was trying to stick the key on her neck. And look, as someone who's been at public events with lawmakers, um, town halls and whatnot, who has seen anti-vaxxers do their little like demonstrations and give their spiel, it is that horrifying. Although I lost a little bit of respect for that lady who was reacting because she was wearing a shirt that's pro uh, House Bill 248 you are very clearly weirded out by her, but this is the crew who you're running with. If you are going to uh, be anti-vax, then this is your people now. So don't act horrified. Own it. You should be embarrassed. Like, hopefully that is a wake-up call for her that mm, I don't want to be associated with these kinds of people. It's already a choice. Um, I'll, just, I'll just sit this one out. But, you know, look, I'm so sick of these pro-pandemic individuals, and I, I'm tired of pretending as if these individuals are just uninformed and, you know, that they're, they're trying their best, but they're just misguided. I'm sick of it. At this point in time, with all of the data and information that's available, if you don't know that the vaccines are safe and effective, then that's a choice at this point, right? And if you're trying to stop these incentive programs, then I can't come to any other conclusion then you're just you're, you're pro pandemic so that's what this is but i mean look it's dangerous i want the vaccine to come to an end or i want the pandemic to come to an end rather and the vaccine is specifically how we're going to do that and guess what it's already working look at the numbers they are dropping rapidly as vaccinations tick up now vaccines They've slowed a little bit because vaccine hesitancy is an issue in the United States of America, which is sad considering many people around the world would would kill for these vaccines that are just widely available here in the United States and North America. But understand that the vaccines work because COVID cases are going down and that's a really good thing. Let's keep that up. Let's not stop. Let's not slow the momentum. Let's keep vaccinating everyone. I got the vaccine. I'm fine. Spoons don't stick to me, unfortunately, because that would be cool. But um, let's stop with the stupidity, please, America.
And I understand from what's been testified to the Forest Service and the BLM, you want very much to uh, work on the issue of climate change. I was uh, uh, informed by the immediate past director of NASA that they have found that the moon's orbit is changing slightly, and so is the Earth's orbit around the sun. Uh, we know there's been a uh, significant solar flare activity. Um, and so is there anything that the National Forest Service or BLM can do to uh, change the course of the moon's orbit or the Earth's orbit around the sun? Obviously, that would have profound effects on our climate. I would have to follow up with you on that one, Mr. Gomert. Yeah. Well, if you figure out a way that you in the uh, Forest Service can make that change, I'd like to know. That was a Republican lawmaker asking seriously whether or not we can forcibly change the orbit of the Earth. Louis Gomert is someone who probably literally believes that pee is stored in the balls. Like, this is the level of intelligence that we're dealing with here. And I know what you're thinking. Like, the lady laughed, so maybe he's just cracking a joke, right? He's being intentionally hyperbolic because he wants to get a reaction out of her. He just wants everyone to get a little bit of a chuckle. Um, mm, not so much. If you think that he's joking there, I mean, sure, that's plausible. But he also said this. He claimed Obama was helping to build a second Ottoman Empire. He was vocally anti-mask. He then subsequently caught COVID-19. And then he questioned whether or not he got COVID-19 from wearing a mask. And then there's also this. But the Attorney General failed to answer my the questions about what was after what he went back to the gentleman in his regular order, Mr. Chairman. Dispersion on my the, asparagus. The, the, the gentleman's... Yeah. Do you honestly believe that that guy wasn't being serious when he asked that question. I just want to know the thought process when he thinks about these questions. Like, if he's asking the question, I mean, obviously he believes that doing that is within the realm of possibility. So in his mind, what would it take to pull something like that off? Like, would we get the shrink ray from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and change it to uh, enlarge and then just like make somebody really, really big and then have them just like ever so slightly tweak the orbit of the earth is that how he thinks it works would be like i don't know put rocket ships on one side of the earth assuming it doesn't spin and just like propel us to like a different orbit i just like i want to know the thought processes like what goes through his mind when he thinks about things like this and furthermore he didn't even have the self-awareness uh, to ask, should I be asking this question? Because sure, maybe we all have beliefs that are uninformed and downright idiotic, but there's also this mechanism in our brains that gets us to kind of self-censor and think, should I be asking this question as an adult? How would this make me look? But he doesn't. He just like lets it all out. Hey, can we just like change the orbit of the Earth? Um, yeah, Louis. We can do that. Definitely, we can do that. How do you propose we do that? I just, look, and if he's laugh, if he's like joking and this is all for a laugh, okay, great. But he shouldn't be making these kinds of jokes because even if we're extra charitable and we assume he is kidding about this, based on the questions he's asked previously, the things that he said, terror babies, look it up. I mean, this is pretty much within the realm of something that he would ask seriously so there's nothing left to be said we have lawmakers in dc now within the republican party literally asking if we can change the orbit of the earth if we could do something like this don't you think like the possibilities would be endless and we wouldn't even be worrying about things like climate change because if we're able to actually change the trajectory of our planet like we would be able to at this point harness our sun's energy, create Dyson spheres, um, you know, actually control the weather. I, this is too much, like, I'm giving him too much credit. Like, he's not thinking about it this far, and he's not that deep of a thinker. But it's a question he asked, so I, I'm assuming he's serious, unless he says otherwise. Um, he's never, like, come out before after saying something stupid and uh, tried to play the, oh, well, I was just kidding, after people say that he's stupid. Like, he's admitted before that he knows people think he's the dumbest member of Congress. So, I mean, I, I just, I don't know. 
This is the state of American politics in 2021. Lawmakers are literally asking questions like this. Back in 2017, a lot of the left was so excited to see a socialist lawmaker get elected to Virginia's House of Delegates. And that individual was Lee Carter. And, you know, seeing him in power, it really sent a message to leftists across the country that if he could get elected, anything is possible. This is not someone who is being accused of being a leftist, as many Democrats are by Republicans. This is someone who self-identified as a leftist. And it was really exciting to see him in a position of power. Now, he ran for governor, and unfortunately, he lost that race. Terry McAuliffe, who was the governor previously, won the Democratic Party primary. So he lost that race, and now he's done. So he decided to take to Twitter to kind of share his experience over the course of the last couple of years, and he really confirmed something that I suspected was true, that even if it's getting better in American society to identify as a socialist and to espouse socialist views and rhetoric, in the real world, especially if you're a lawmaker, it's really, really difficult to exist as an out and proud socialist. So he writes via Twitter, this job has made me miserable for the last four years. I made a lot of people's lives objectively better, but the constant assassination threats and harassment were terrible for my family and my health. I'm relieved to say that I've done my part and now it's someone else's turn. I helped get health insurance for half a million people. I helped thousands of diabetic people pay for insulin. I helped legalize cannabis. I helped end the death penalty. I helped workers own their cooperative businesses. I helped people unionize. I'm going to sleep well, and he should. What he accomplished is just incredible, and he's one of the socialist lawmakers around the country that proved that their politics is incredibly effective. I mean, him, Shama Sawant, these folks are showing that when you have people powered behind you, you can actually govern in an effective manner, even if you have big business and your colleagues against you. And there were so many times where he was taunted by his own colleagues in the governing body in Virginia. I mean, there was the time when somebody held up a hammer and sickle sign to taunt him. And this is not a Republican who's doing this. This is a Democrat. And also he shared a boomer meme that Republicans made and shared a, a, about him. Uh, they were basically trying to attack him as part of this red baiting bullshit. It's just, he faced this constantly. And I'm sure that he's not even sharing all of it. And to me, it's, it's discouraging, right? Because it feels as if it's getting more easy for people to, you know, come out as a socialist, for lack of a better word. And socialism is becoming more popular. You know, more far left ideologies like anarchism, communism, they are getting increasingly popular in the United States. And that's going to continue as capitalism fails. But we're still not to the point where it's easy to govern as a socialist. And part of this is, I think, reason why individuals like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, over time, they kind of get a little bit more, or I should say less radicalized, seemingly. And they kind of learn to play the game in D.C. as it is, and they're not as firebrand as when they got elected. Because I think that the system just, like, beat you down. I mean, AOC even said that she felt like she wasn't even sure that she wanted to run for a second term because the Democratic Party was just so unwelcoming unwel to her. And that's putting aside all of the threats that she gets from Republicans. So, I mean, the system itself is designed to beat you down. This is what capitalism does. So the fact that... You know, Lee Carter was there. He put up with so much bullshit for multiple years and he was still this effective. I think it really speaks to, you know, the spirit of so many people around this country who are fighting to make the world a better place. So Lee Carter, nothing but love and solidarity for you, brother. I think that what you did was just incredible. You created a blueprint and a lot of people will look up to you for decades to come for inspiration because what you pulled off, I mean... That's that's the blueprint. That's that's the map. That's what we have to do. And maybe, you know, you might not be able to have a long career as a socialist lawmaker. Maybe it'll beat you down. But if you get in there for a couple of years and you improve people's lives in a really concrete way, as Lee Carter did, that's still something that's totally commendable that should be applauded. So I absolutely am thankful for Lee Carter. You know, would I have loved to see him become the governor and one day president of the United States? Obviously, yes, but still what he accomplished should not be minimized. It should be celebrated because it is really damn hard to be a socialist in the United States of America still till this day. You know, the McCarthyite red baiting smears are going to continue to exist, but with time, things will change. They just haven't necessarily changed as much 
as we would have hoped to this point. But still, hats off to you, Lee Carter. You did excellent, and you absolutely should be proud of yourself. Well, that's all that I've got for you today. Thank you so much for tuning in if you've made it this far. Uh, as usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of the folks who make this show possible, all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, YouTube, and Twitch subscribers. You all are absolutely the lifeblood of the show. You help us not just to survive, but thrive as well, and I absolutely appreciate you. So thank you all so much. Uh, that's everything. Uh, as usual, if you want more of The Humanist Report, you can tune in every single Thursday at 7 p.m. PST to watch me, uh, you know, talk shit on Twitch, play video games, just kind of hang out. And coming soon on June 23rd, you can catch me live every single Wednesday right here on our YouTube channel for Dystopian Times. It's going to be uh, awesome. So I'll see you all next week. I'm done talking. I'm rambling. My brain is fried. Uh, Yeah, I'll see you all next week. <laughs> Take care, everyone. My name is Mike Figueredo. This has been The Humanist Report. Peace.